Hello, everyone, and welcome to EA Global. My name is Amy Levent, um, and I'm head of events at CEA. We are so excited to welcome you to the biggest ever in-person conference and gathering of the EA community. So some advice that I always say about getting the most out of the conference is to prioritize one-on-ones. So I say this every time, and then every time in the feedback survey, people are like, oh, I didn't take Amy seriously enough. I wish I would have done more one-on-ones or prioritized one-on-ones. So I'm gonna say it again, um, and I look forward to your feedback at the end where you tell me I should have stressed it more. Um, so the reason I say this is because people always tell me that they met their best friend or a job um, or meet future collaborators. Um, an example for my team, I believe I met every single person on my team through one of our events. Um, and I think more than half of them as volunteers at a previous EA Global. Um, another bit of advice that I'd suggest is go for a walk, make time for self-care. So we have nap room, we have chill space, quiet space. Um, take, take some time to like chill out for a sec because we are going to have a lot of one-on-ones, we're going to have some content, there's going to be a lot of people here. So yeah, just like check in with yourself. We want everyone to feel comfortable, welcome at the event. If that's ever not the case, um, Julia Wise is our community health point person. So please, you know, reach out to Julia. You can find her on Swap Card or like anyone here at the registration desk or with a blue shirt can help you get her. Um, so yeah, I'm so excited just to see like, I'm just like standing here looking at all of you. I'm so excited to see the growth of the EA community. Um, so I was in my Uber this morning and I was like, okay, take me to the Barbican. He's like, oh, you're going to the Save the World conference or something like that? <laughs> and I was like, um, okay, like, do I wanna try to get some nuance into this? No, I'm just chill. But apparently Thomas um, let him know that we were having a, our biggest conference yet and told him it was 1,400 people, which is what we've been saying, but actually just checked in and it's 1,500 people this time. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, it's, it's blowing my mind because we're, I wasn't exactly sure how it was going to work. I mean, we had London like six months ago, and then we've had our two biggest EAGX conferences back to back this month, one in Oxford and then one in uh, Boston, and they were like 600 or a thousand, one was like 600, one was a thousand. I mean, these things are huge, and now you're all here too. Um, so yeah, I'm just really excited about the growth and like really excited for my team and the volunteers and all their help because... Um, like so far in 2022, we facilitated more connections, so like one-on-ones that people say, like, I feel comfortable reaching out to someone to ask for a favor, than in 2021 as a whole. So like 2022 so far, not even counting this conference, we've already like surpassed what we did last year. Um, and we recently approved 20 community, <clears throat> community events grants including an EAGX in Mexico and an EAGX in India. <laughs> so yeah, just uh, I wanted to say thanks again to all of our volunteers. You can see them in blue. Um, we've got 75 here this time. Um, and so yeah, they'll always be able to help you out. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Sim and she will introduce Will. Thanks so much. Hi everyone. Um, what was that? <laughs> uh, this is going to be the shortest talk to clap ratio, so thanks for that. Um, so yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce our headline speaker today, Will McCaskill. Um, Will, as I'm sure you know, is an associate professor um, of philosophy at Oxford University. He's a senior research fellow at the Global Priorities Institute, and he's also an advisor to the FTX Future Fund. Uh, so Will is a progenitor of the Effective Altruism Movement, and he co-founded uh, 80,000 Hours, Giving What We Can, and the Center for Effective Altruism. He's also the author of Doing Good Better, Moral Uncertainty, and his upcoming book, What We Owe the Future. So please join me in welcoming Will.
Hello, EA Global. So yeah, it's absolutely wonderful um, to see so many people here. Um, there's an awful lot of new faces, people I don't know yet, so I'm really excited to get to know um, many of you over the next couple of days. And even since the last EA Global London, which was uh, October, November last year, uh, an awful lot has changed. So as uh, many of you know, back then I was uh, a proud adherent of long hairism. <laughs> that, was, that was me, but things have changed. Um, this is a huge development, but I want to reassure everyone that there's a further view, a further hairstyle choice, strong short hairism, <laughs> which I will never adhere to, unlike, <laughs> unlike some others. Uh, so as Amy said, this is the biggest EAG ever. It's uh, 1,500 people, and Honestly, it feels kind of bizarre. Um, it feels pretty strange being uh, on this stage. We've got this weird um, light bulb symbol that honestly got made in like, you know, 20 minutes at some point in like 2011 and is now um, as this model. It's like a very strange feeling. Um, it's really quite humbling actually. And uh, just recently I went on a little kind of tour down memory lane. And uh, that included going to the original office that Center for Effective Altruism rented back in 2013, um, which is this. And you might think, oh, okay, the office, it's been um, converted into um, an estate agent. But no, this, the, the estate agent was there. We were in the basement. <laughs> um, and I actually have evidence of this, um, which is here. So um, this was everyone back in 2013. This is actually only about half the team uh, who was working there. They were kind of 12 to 15 people kind of crammed into this tiny room. I remember one of the early major funders kind of came to visit, and when he saw it, his comment was, is this legal? <laughs> um, and I think the answer was probably not, actually. Um, in the middle, those of you who know him will recognize Rob Wiblin. Rob has been to uh, every single EA Global since 2013, but this is actually the first one he's not coming to which means I can get away with doing this close-up of him. <laughs> Beautiful even then. Uh, okay, so reiterating a little bit of what Amy said, how can you use this conference as well as possible? Well, one thing to emphasize is just look after yourself. These conferences are extremely kind of intense. There's an awful lot of people. There will be always be more meetings and more things you want to do than it's possible to do. Uh, that doesn't mean just totally burn yourself out. There will be more EA Globals to come. Um, as ever, this being an EA event, there's a nap room. You can um, take uh, time to kind of uh, chill out. Um, another thing to do is just ask people for help. So I'll be talking a little bit about making bold, ambitious plans. Uh, this is an environment where we all have basically the same goal, just trying to do as much good as possible. And that means if someone else can help you um, in achieving your path to that, then that's a way of them achieving their aims too. So please have a very low bar for uh, being able to, you know, asking other people for help. At the same time, feel more than empowered to say no <laughs> if someone is asking for your help and you're just, you think you just don't have time or um, it would be stressful for whatever reason. That's okay too. Um, and then the final thing is don't feel like you need to defer. Um, the thing that I find myself telling people most often, I think one-on-one, -on -one, is don't merely go with kind of what you regard as like high status people in the community or people that you think have more expertise than you. This question of how we do as much good as possible, it's very hard and it will often be very person specific too. And that means it's just very important, if you can, to really just try and um, build up a a view and a worldview um, of yourself, such that things, you know, the things you believe you've like reason to from uh, like on your own rather than simply kind of deferring to other people. And I'm going to talk uh, in a minute about uh, the kind of unofficial theme of this conference, a culture of ambition. Uh, but before then, I'm going to give you all just one minute to say hi to uh, a couple of the people next to you. And if you want, you can. 
uh, ask them for some help, or you can um, say something where, ah, it seems like there's this view that's widely held, but I don't really buy it, and um, that can be in the spirit of not deferring. So I'll give you just one minute. Thanks. <laughs> Great, okay, so I'm just gonna say um, a few words about the unofficial theme, a culture of ambition. And, um, you know, I mentioned not deferring. In the spirit of that, I will emphasize these are just like my takes, my early thoughts. Um, don't feel like you have to believe everything I say. So, okay, the theme is a culture of ambition. And um, why, why is there now this kind of newfound emphasis um, from this and also the last kind of few EAGs on this idea of being ambitious, having really big plans and aims? Well, I think there's kind of three reasons. First is kind of a more theoretical consideration of just the fact that impact um, quite plausibly forms this fat-tailed distribution, and I'll talk a little bit about that. A second is just when we reflect on our successes to date um, over the last 12, 15 years. Um, and then finally is just the current situation we're in as well, kind of potential opportunities um, that we have available to us. So um, we'll start off with this kind of graph of uh, fat-tailed impact. Um, on the y-axis can be like number of opportunities or kind of probability of success. This is kind of illustrating a log normal distribution, but maybe it could be other sorts of um, fat-tailed distribution. It doesn't talk about the harm side of things. That's important as well. Um, obviously, in reality, you have a chance of doing harm as a way, as, in addition to, um, uh, in, as well as like, you know, potentially doing a lot of good. But the striking thing is that um, if impact has this kind of fat-tailed distribution, and that's what seems to be the case when we look at the data from global health or when we look at the impact from people learning to give um, in terms of just how much uh, money you could potentially make or donate, or in other areas too, research as well. Well, the kind of key thing is that the median is smaller than the mean. And so if you try to just do a kind of typical amount of good, um, kind of, uh, you know, kind of safe path or something, you're probably gonna do less good in expectation than if you set some kind of bolder plan and aim for really kind of achieving the best case outcome, even if that means you'll kind of probably fail along the way. And so that suggests that certainly once we've got kind of a large community of people, having many people trying to achieve very big things and many or even most of those people like failing to achieve those big things ends up being worth it. We do more good overall because the wins when we get them are just, you know, the hits are just um, so great, so important, so valuable. So that's kind of background theoretical consideration. But the second is just reflecting on how much good we've done so far, the kind of successes we've already had. And that's in kind of all of the main effective altruist cause areas. Um, so against Malaria Foundation, Almost all of its funding came from uh, GiveWell and other EA sources. Uh, it has now protected over 400 million people um, from malaria by distributing uh, long-lasting insecticide-treated bed nets. That's like really pretty amazing. Uh, within animal welfare, uh, because of corporate cage-free campaigns from Mercy for Animals, uh, the Humane League, and other organizations, uh, there are now hundreds of millions of hens that uh, do not live in caged conditions, like as a result of those campaigns. So in the US, the number of, um, the proportion of hens brought up in caged conditions uh, was around 7% in about 2015, and now it's almost a third. Um, so again, this is like this, you know, huge impact measured in the hundreds of billions of beings being impacted. Um, within AI, I have kind of seen uh, the I very idea of AI safety go from just the fringiest of fringe concerns, the sort of thing it's like a handful of people talking about in you know, seminar rooms in Oxford or uh, very small research institutes in the Bay, to now being a like, fairly respectable and mainstream field within machine learning with labs at the top places like DeepMind, OpenAI. So that's the kind of successes we've had to date. The third is just the opportunities available to us as well. 
where now, especially compared to just even a few years ago, there's much more potential opportunity within the areas of policy and politics. Uh, the UN, for example, the Secretary General released our common agenda, which uses language that is distinctively focused on um, long-termist issues or, um, and existential risks, and plans to host a summit for the future in 2023 as well. Uh, within other areas of policy and politics within the US and UK, um, there's also just kind of much greater inroads than there ever have been. And of course, the really striking thing over the past year, as well as just like the success in fundraising as well, where both through um, open philanthropy representing Dustin Moskowitz and Carrie Tuna's um, giving, uh, and also the success of Sam Bankman-Fried with FTX um, and the early, other early employees there now, there's gonna, we're gonna, there's just gonna be an enorm enormous scale up in the amount of giving that's happening where kind of total year givings may be like half a billion if we look at last year um, across all the cause areas. The biggest scale up I think is gonna be within uh, the near termist side of things, especially kind of global health and well-being. So GiveWell aiming to move um, over the billion dollars per year um, within open philanthropy, the global health and well-being side will scale up to something like half a billion per year. Um, and then within the long-term side of things, that will, I think, scale up from 100 million to like several hundred million per year. But in terms of the financial assets that the main kind of EA donors have, even just scaling up to the point where we're spending the interest will mean going considerably beyond that again, um, scaling up to, you know, two or three billion dollars per year. And that puts us in just a, quite a weird situation. Um, a situation that's both an incredible opportunity, like a very unusual opportunity to do an enormous amount of good, uh, but it's also an absolutely huge moral responsibility, one that we should take very seriously. Uh, and so for me, working on this stuff for many years, I feel like the stakes have just really never been higher morally. And that means we should um, think very seriously about how we're gonna make the most of this situation. Did everyone just like very uh, viscerally hear me drinking there? <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, okay, so I think there are two ways we could fail to make the most of this situation, kind of in light of the considerations I've said. One is thinking too small. Um, so it's a striking fact that many of the biggest foundations, like what do they do? Well, they just kind of give their 5%, which is legally mandated every year, and they persist for this very long time. If you look at um, the Gates Foundation, a foundation I admire kind of very deeply, and the foundation that gives the most per year, um, if I'm correct, uh, out of any, anywhere else. Well, I think it's still given way less than it ought to have done. <laughs> um, and it's really struggled at like giving three and a half billion per year. I think it ought to have been giving much more, maybe 10 billion per year. Um, that kind of shows just like how big a, how much of a challenge it is to like um, think, think sufficiently big. Um, and make the most of opportunities that one has available. Um, the other half, the other side is like going mad and like <laughs> this idea of like being really ambitious, kind of damaging EH culture in some way. And so I'll talk a little bit more about this kind of responsibility aspect first, before then moving again onto the opportunity and showcasing some of the uh, ambitious projects I think are happening at the moment. So what are some of the ways in which um, we could respond badly to the opportunities we have. Um, well, one is just if we start kind of, you know, having kind of mission drift and having this appearance of extravagance rather than, um, rather than kind of maintaining that same mentality that, you know, those early employees had sitting in this basement at the bottom of an estate agent. Um, because, well, what does like being ambitious mean? It doesn't mean like throwing money around necessarily, like unnecessarily. Um, also doesn't necessarily mean like having huge staff or doing things that feel very flashy or kind of high status. So this is an example of an extraordinarily ambitious and extraordinarily successful organization. I just talked about them against Malaria Foundation. They have protected 400 million people from malaria. They have a staff of nine. Um, that is just like this incredible thing. And the fact that they have such a small staff and they've done this um, 
on su with such a lean team. Um, it is, makes it more impressive, like not less. It makes them more ambitious, not less. Uh, also means they still have this incredibly janky website that looks like it's from the 1990s. Um, I think it's now a core part of their brand. Maybe they can't leave it. But it looked bad even when they started, like you know, 10 years ago. Um, so that shows how you can be kind of ambitious without being flashy on the project level. Um, but it's also true on an individual level as well. Um, I think it can be easy to get sucked into things that like feel big and important and high, like high stakes or like high energy rather than the things that are actually most impactful. So in the next slide, I'll show you an example of someone who, again, is very ambitious and very successful, but maybe doesn't look it. Um, this, is Peter, this is my favorite photo of Peter Singer. Um, <laughs> I still don't know why he's cradling some carrots like a baby. <laughs> um, I'll ask him one day. Um, but he had this enormous impact. When Luke Melhausen interviewed the top like, 40 of the leading animal welfare advocates, um, half of them said that they had got into this cause because of leading animal liberation. But think about, and so this is enormous impact, but what would his life have looked like? Well, when I'm writing, it involves being in a dressing gown with a cup of tea on a couch. Like, it doesn't feel like the highest stakes or like, flashiest thing. But that doesn't mean it's not the most impactful. So that's one way in which kind of this message could go awry. A couple of others as well. Um, one is just uh, kind of harming the epistemic culture um, of EA, where you, know, you look at other social movements, and you often get this um, kind of club, like the certain beliefs that just everyone holds, and it becomes an indicator of uh, in-group kind of mentality. Uh, and that can get strengthened if it's the case of like, oh, well, um, if you, know, uh, you want to get funding and want to achieve like, big things, then you have to believe certain things. I think that would be very bad indeed um, for uh, the effect of altruism community. I think looking at other kind of social movements should make us worried about that as a failure mode for ourselves as well. Um, and then the final worry is just um, that we might lose a kind of evolutionary pressure uh, that we have cultivated. So again, looking at other kind of nonprofits, one of the early critiques from effective altruism is just nonprofits in their nature, bad nonprofits don't die, <laughs> even though they should. Because uh, in the case of you know, a startup, well, a successful startup is one that makes money, an unsuccessful one is like one that's not making money, the unsuccessful ones will die off and the successful ones will grow. Whereas in the nonprofit world, it's how well c can you fundraise rather than um, uh, how big an impact are you having. And if it becomes kind of too easy to get funding and everyone wants to have their own project and do their own ambitious things, well, then you can just have this situation where you've got many, many projects that just kind of linger on, even though it would be better for it to shut down and the people to work elsewhere. And so that suggests that um, even in a situation where we're encouraging people to do lots of things and ambitious things, and often try things that have a, um, you know, some chance of amazing success, but also some significant chance of failing, well, we need to kind of follow through on that, and that means that many things will end up failing. So we should keep these kind of very high standards for um, impact. Being ambitious doesn't mean we kind of lower our standards in any way. OK, so what does being ambitious in practice mean? Well, I'm going to kind of draw out three lessons. There's obviously much more you could say. Uh, firstly is just actually try. <laughs> uh, might seem kind of obvious, but I actually think it's the most important. A second, which I've kind of hinted at already, is this idea of expecting to fail. And thirdly is being willing to pivot. And I'll kind of explain these again with respect to this kind of distribution of fat-tailed impact. Well, firstly is actually try. If you're just kind of not going to aim to achieve something that's uh, really at the tail of impact, the lower probability chance of doing something super high impact, well, it's just, you know, you're not going to end up there. It's like you can only have big wins if you're actually kind of setting out to try to achieve them. Instead, you're going to end up with something like the modal impact or the median impact, which is just going to be much lower. Second, in terms of expecting to fail, most, if you're aiming for this kind of, you know, really big win impact, probably it's not going to happen. Um, and that's okay. Then the third thing is being willing to pivot. 
where even if you're doing quite well, even if the amount of impact you're having is something more like the mean impact, well, you can do better <laughs> because there are these um, opportunities to have even larger impact out on the tail. And that means if you see such an opportunity, you should you know, really be wi willing to change what you're doing um, and focus on that. And that could be changing within your own organization, or it could be just be saying like, look, there's this other thing that's doing even better. I should help that thing rather than work on my own project. So I'll just give some examples of um, what I find kind of inspiring successes um, uh, in terms of these lessons. So in terms of actually trying, this is an organization that I only really got to know um, uh, a few weeks ago, the Lead Exposure Elimination um, Project. And I just think this is like this amazing kind of story from within effective altruism, where there was the search done trying to figure out what are some neglected issues where plausibly people pushing on this could have an enormous impact. It was discovered that lead exposure is one, it's enormously harmful, um, both for general health and for um, brain development. Uh, and so then, um, I mean, I found this out through uh, Claire Donaldson at a talk at EAGX Oxford. Um, but on the basis of just a team of three people, they uh, managed to convince the government of uh, Malawi to ban um, lead paint, um, which will do this enormous amount of good, in my view. And it was very simple to do that. Uh, they just went to Malawi, bought enormous amounts of paint, tested it for lead, took it to the government. Turns out the government already had regulation against this. It's just that they weren't impl implementing it. Um, but that would have never happened if they hadn't kind of actually tried. Second example is Alvia. Um, uh, by a medical um, startup, uh, again created by Ethan Alley and others, um, part of the effective altruism community, where, you know, in, I think it was December of last year, uh, they thought, look, we probably just could create an Omicron-specific vaccine. And you might think, that just seems absurd. There's these kind of huge pharma companies, Pfizer, Moderna, and so on. Like, there's just no way like, they would be able to compete. But yet, they just thought, look, maybe we'll fail, but we can actually just try this. Um, and so they've launched. They've, they're scaling up fairly rapidly. I think they ha now have almost 50 people. They, had, they created the world's first BA2 Omicron-specific vaccine. Um, again, I don't know if they'll succeed, but they've certainly got a good chance. And if so, then they could help create a world where when the next pandemic comes, we're able to scale up vaccine production in a matter of weeks rather than the many, many months that uh, it took um, uh, during the current pandemic. So that's the idea of actually trying. The other hand, expecting to fail. So FTX, probably something you'll hear a lot about, set up by Sam Bankman-Fried and others. Um, with, it's a cryptocurrency exchange um, with the idea of kind of earning to give. Uh, they had already been working on quite a successful crypto trading fund. And given that, you might think, oh, well, this is going well. <laughs> they should just kind of keep doing that. Because they thought they were already existing crypto exchanges. Sam was prob probably the most optimistic among the um, early creators of how well, of how likely it was that they would actually be able to do something that was pretty successful. And he put it about 20%. Uh, and so they did something that they thought would probably fail. In the end, it didn't fail, actually, it paid off. Um, and that's not to say that uh, their probabilities were wrong. <laughs> Bear in mind, I wouldn't be talking about them, probably, if they had um, been in that 80% chance of failing. But certainly, kind of given the success that they've had and um, the amount of good they're gonna be able to do with um, the money they've raised as a result, it makes the 20% chance of achieving that outcome really well worth it. Now that was an uh, uh, success story where they thought there was a high chance of failure but actually pulled it off. In other cases though, that doesn't happen. And so here's an organization that maybe you haven't heard of. In fact, people don't talk about it that much anymore. No lean season. But they were an extremely promising organization. Uh, so I went through them um, in, with Y Combinator. They were incubated by Evidence Action, which also produced uh, Deworm the World. There was a strong evidence base behind them as well, where, uh, yeah, the idea was that they could simply pay for people to, or help subsidize people to move to cities where they could be much more economically productive. It seemed like uh, people in uh, 
for the countries that they were working in, when they did move to cities, they would actually just get kind of 700 more calories per, um, uh, per day, equivalent to like an extra meal per day. And that just, you know, it was looking very promising indeed. But they did more work on it. There was an RCT, in fact. And the RCT found that the impact they were having was just not quite what they were expecting in terms of, uh, you know, what the earlier evidence had been suggesting. And so what did they do? Well, most nonprofits, most organizations would try and keep going anyway. They'd say, well, it's maybe justified in other grounds. But not them. In this incredibly virtuous um, action, they simply shut down. And so no living season just doesn't exist anymore. And I think that should just be enormously praised. Um, and that should be true within effective altruism as well. If you have something, it doesn't succeed, um, you close it down, maybe write up a report. I think that sh should be something that's just, uh, you know, we think of extraordinarily highly um, as a community. Okay, I'm going to drink some more water. I'm going to try and... Uh, <laughs> nice, good. Okay, was that less gross for you? Okay, thanks. Okay, then the final thing is being willing to pivot. Um, I guess I kind of think about this, you know, this can mean it as an organization or, in my own, or as an individual. In my own case, I think the best decision I ever made um, was back in 2009. You know, I had this plan to be a, uh, to, you know, be a philosophy um, professor, uh, and, but met Toby Ord and we had this idea for giving what we can. And I was just like, oh, my plans suck compared to this. I'm just going to help you. <laughs> and started off helping him in like, these very menial ways, like finding photos for the website and so on. Um, and it was just the best decision I made, because his plans were just way better than mine. And I think that can often be the case. Like, you can have, being ambitious does not mean like, having your own thing, necessarily. It can mean contributing to um, someone else's thing. But it can also mean, even within your own organization, um, being able to switch what you're doing. And so a great example of this comes from our world and data, where you know, they were providing general information about the state of the world um, we, with kind of beautiful graphs and very um, careful kind of research presentations. But then in early 2020, they just realized the scale of the COVID pandemic and how important it would be to provide uh, high quality data um, on that pandemic to inform decision makers. And so they just you know, didn't entirely drop everything else they were doing, but made an enormous pivot to start building out just the best source of data on COVID-19 um, in the world. And this is what the web traffic looks like over the years. Um, you can tell these last two years, um, and eat, it's worth bearing in mind, this is not from a small um, baseline as well. Even those uh, smaller graphs would put them by far as the most popular um, effective altruist organization measured by web traffic. And their data, in fact, is used by all the world's leading um, uh, uh, like informa uh, informational bodies. So the New York Times, the World Health Organization, um, you know, the president relies on, both presidents that's been in um, power have relied on our world and data. Okay, so let's um, sum up on the basis of this. There's kind of two things I want to convey. One is that given the track record, given the opportunities available to us, given just what we should expect as well, we should have this incredible opportunity to do an enormous amount of good, but that comes along with this enormous responsibility to make sure we don't you know, mess up this opportunity. Um, and I really think that if we're able and willing to do kind of two things at once, um, one is form very bold and ambitious plans, really taking seriously the potential upside you can have if you really aim for the best, while at the same time keeping the same kind of standards of kind of moral and epistemic rigor um, that effective altruism has had for um, all these years. Well, if we can achieve both of those things, well, I think we can do some really pretty amazing things. Thank you. <laughs>